All right, so what types of um, nitrogens are going to be able to go through this category two type reaction? I'm uh, sorry, this category three type reaction, only nitrogens that have at least two hydrogens. So what type would that be? Well, what type of nitrogen was this, primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary. This is primary. How about ammonia? That could also do it, because it, it has way more hydrogens than it needs. So only like ammonium and primary ones can... Only ammonia and primary amines would go through this category three reaction. That's right. This cat Remember, that was our goal here. We need to go through all the different types of nitrogen-containing compounds and figure out what categories they're in, and when possible, we'd like to know the reason. Well, now we can see the reason. To attack twice with a single atom, you have to have at least two hydrogens. Well, that means you're either a primary amine or you're ammonia. I don't think we need to go through the mechanism for ammonia because it would be very similar to what we just did for the primary amine. Yeah. So, um, but those would be the two that would be in that group there. I think you can see that in the handout. Notice here that at the top of page two, we said, um, oh, so this should be R and H2. So I could have said that that means it's primary. I probably should have included it could have been ammonia as well. So this is for category three here, it is for our primary amines and ammonia. And now we can understand why that is and why alcohol doesn't, why alcohol has to be category two with two separate alcohols, because each alcohol can only attack once, because they can only deprotonate once. So that explains one of our key aspects. In a second, we'll see what secondary amines do. But for, uh, first of all, we have to finish off with uh, this reaction. Let's see, another, uh, so, I'm going to continue putting an asterisk here to show that this used to be the carbonyl carbon. Now, this is also what we could call a hidden carbonyl, because again, this reaction is reversible. This is reversible, so this is another hidden carbonyl. Remember, a good side of a hidden carbonyl is a carbon with two bonds to electronegative atoms. Well, here we do have two bonds to electronegative atoms. They just happen to be to the same electronegative atom. But a good sign of a hidden carbonyl is a carbon with two bonds to electronegative atoms. So here we have another hidden carbonyl. Um, and that means there must be some way that we can make this into, um, back into a carbonyl, that some way we can reverse this. Well, this is actually very similar to the way that we reversed category two. How would we reverse this reaction? What reagent do we need to add? H2O and acid. That's right. The, yes, the best way would be H3O+. plus. Since we did this acid catalyzed, we should add acid and water. What would be the role of the water? The water would have the carbonyl oxygen, and that's why we keep on putting the star. Yeah, And the excellent. acid would drive it like, forward. Yeah, and the acid would be the catalyst, all right, which helps both the forward and the reverse. That's why it's helpful to see in the forward reaction, the carbonyl oxygen left as water. So the logical way to put the carbonyl oxygen back on is to add excess water, and that will that'll drive the reaction in the reverse direction. This is the same way that we saw to reverse category two reactions. You said the hidden, a good way to notice the hidden carbonyl is a carbon attached to two electronegative atoms? The best way to put it is a carbon with two bonds to electronegative atoms. So what would be the product if we added H3O plus to this? Well, these would be the two products. It would just reverse the reaction and we would get these two products out over here. Now, why is this reversible uh, and some other reactions are not? Well, in order for this to reverse, we have to kick the nitrogen off. So the nitrogen has to be possibly be able to be a leaving group, basically. Well, it's true that nitrogens can possibly be leaving groups. That's the reason why this reaction is reversible. The nitrogen can be a leaving group. Um, so that gives us an explanation for why this is reversible. You can kind of see that this nitrogen looks like a good leaving group, doesn't it? If we just reverse these steps, mm -hmm. this nitrogen right now looks like it really wants to leave before it deprotonates. So that's the explanation for why this was reversible, because somewhere along the way, we can have a nitrogen that's an acceptable leaving group. Um, how about category one reactions? Some of those um, are not reversible. For example, if you attack with a Grignard, that's not reversible. Well, you can see why, because a Grignard is a carbon nucleophile. But Carbons are not leaving groups. We never see a carbon leaving group. So that was kind of the ex someone was asking, how can we tell when these are reversible and when they're not? Well, when the nucleophile that's joining on might possibly be a leaving group that could later leave, then the reaction can go either way. If the nucleophile can both join or leave, then the reaction is potentially reversible. Well, we can see that a nitrogen can be a nucleophile, but it can also possibly be a leaving group. So the reaction can go in either direction. But what if we attack with a Grignard? Well, we know that Grignards have carbon nucleophiles, but we've almost never seen a carbon leaving group. 
we really don't see carbon leaving groups. So once the, car once the grid yard has joined, it can't really leave. And that's the reason why that turns out not to be a reversible reaction. Another reaction we saw was with lithium aluminum hydride. Well, again, hydrogen can, can join. Say, Sorry? Yeah, but it can join, but it's never going to be like a nuclear. It's never going to be a leaving group, is what we want to say. Yeah. That's right. It, the, the, this, gives, this gives us a source of hydrogen nucleophiles, but we pretty much never see hydrogen leaving groups. This is not going to be a leaving group, and therefore this reaction is not reversible either. So that's the basic principle for how someone can figure out whether a reaction is reversible or not, whether the nucleophile could potentially be a leaving group as well. If the nucleophile could potentially be a leaving group as well, then the reaction can go in both directions. On the other hand, you probably don't want to have to figure that out from scratch uh, during the test, so it's also good to memorize which reactions are reversible and which ones are not. But that's the general pattern. Okay, so that was um, our attack by a primary amine. Now, um, you should also know the mechanism for the reverse reaction here. You need to know the mechanism. We saw that we could reverse this by adding H3O+. Um, it's pretty similar to the, the reverse reaction for category 2, which we went over before, yeah, and it's in the uh, handout yeah. um, as well. So um, do you guys want to go over that, or should we just keep on going to category 4? Keep going. I That's fine. Guess. Okay. But uh, you should review that on your own. You can see that's here in the right-hand column at the top of page 2. And remember, you have to read that from the bottom up. So if you go from the bottom up, that shows you how to reverse that reaction. And it's pretty similar to page 1, where we showed how to reverse the category 2 reaction. So you can go through that on your own. Oh, a couple other things to mention. What type of functional group is this? An amine. Yeah. And this? Carbon carbonyl. Carbon or a ketone? Yeah, we want to be more specific and say it's a ketone. Of course, this would also have worked on an aldehyde. And what type of functional group is this, where we have a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen? We haven't talked about that. Maybe you picked that up from lecture. An imine? Good, that's good. This oh, is an imine. Like now, unfortunately, at this point, we're going to start seeing a bunch of words that sound similar, are easy to confuse. Yeah. For example, it's easy to confuse amines and imines. Mm. And later, you're going to see amides. Yeah. So um, we, want to keep, uh, we want to keep all of those separate. Here we've seen an amine, that's a nitrogen connected to carbon chains and hydrogens. But here we have an imine. An imine is a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon. An imine is a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon. That's an important type of functional group to memorize the name for. So this is a reaction here that makes an imine. If you look at your handout, uh, that's also mentioned in the handout that's uh, on page two, that this reaction gives us an imine. If we start with ammonia or a primary amine. Uh, one other thing that's important to mention here is that, um, so in general, this reaction works for this type of nucleophile. This reaction works for ammonia or this type of nucleophile. Normally, we think of the R as a carbon chain. However, this, the R could be something more interesting here. For example, this is another, um, the R could be, in this case, other types of functional groups, like NH2 or... NH2. So in this case, R doesn't mean carbon chain. That's right. And that's also in the handout if you look at the top. It says that the R group could be many different things. Um, and that's all spelled out here at the top of, whoops, page two. The R could be um, uh, R OH, which would be a hydroxyl amine. That's right. Or in H 2 there's even something complicated called a semi-carboside or something. Let's see if oh, I can yeah. draw that. The R could even be this complicated thing over here, which I think is called a semi-carboside. I don't know if your instructor went over that, but uh, this definitely is going to be important in the course. Um, so anyway, uh, this is called hydrazine, this is called uh, hydroxyl amine, this is called a semi-carboside. All those names are at the top of page two in the handout. Yeah. Uh, and then there's names for what you get for those products. For example, if you attack with this, you get a hydrazone. Or if you attack with hydroxyl amine, you get an oxime. Or if you attack with a semi-carbazide, you get a semi-carbazone. All those names for those, all those different types of products are listed down here. Inine, oxime, hydrazone, semi-carbazone here on page two. So. Okay, so that was something else to watch out for uh, here. And like I said, you guys should on your own go through the reverse mechanism because that's something you can test on. And still another point, this reaction can be either acid or base catalyzed. This can be either acid or base catalyzed. However, uh, you're probably not responsible for the base catalyzed mechanism. So I didn't put that in the handout. Um, I don't think that's in the textbook even. So you probably would not be expected to do the mechanism for base catalyzed. You should just be able to go from starting materials to products. Okay. 
but this could be acid or base catalyzed. I think that's in the handout as well. Uh, and one more point, a lot of the time people seem to get sloppy and they leave out the catalyst entirely. But you definitely need it. I think that the reaction does need a catalyst. However, if you see a, a, a homework problem where they give you a primary amine and an aldehyde or a ketone, you should still predict this product even if they didn't bother to mention um, the, the catalyst. Again, it, people just seem to be kind of sloppy and sometimes leave the catalyst out here. It, it's not going to be a trick question where they're saying, oh, we got you, you, you need the catalyst. You're not going to see that type of thing. Even if they don't mention the catalyst, apparently you're supposed to assume it's there. Uh, for some reason, oftentimes that's not actually drawn on these. All right. So those are the points for primary amine and for um, ammonia. All right. So let's keep going.